Let's take our Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. We're continuing our series on strong and courageous um, messages through the book of Joshua. And today is perhaps the most familiar of all the sections of the book of Joshua. It's the fall of the walls of Jericho. How many of you are familiar with the story of the walls of Jericho falling down? Um, it's, it is a favorite Sunday school lesson that we most of us have uh, been exposed to. Um, and today we're hopefully going to address this in a way that we uh, share some, some new insights into this passage. Um, I would like to read verses 1 through 5, verse 16, and then um, scattering the verses on through the, the end of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, just kind of skip down through the text with me. Um, we don't have time to read the entire chapter before I would do that. I've entitled my message today, What God Wants from His Children. What God Wants from His Children. Very interesting, the conquest of the city of Jericho was God's doing. It was all about what God was going to do. And yet he had some very specific instructions for the children of Israel. They didn't just stand back and do nothing. There were some very specific things that God called upon them to do. Let's begin reading Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut because the sons of Israel... No one went out and no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war encircling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall, bow, shall blow the trumpets. It shall be, shall be when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people will go up, every man, straight ahead. Verse 16. At the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted, and priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went into the city, every man straight ahead. And they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. They burned the city with fire and all that was in it. Only the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. However, Rahab, the harlot, and her father's household, and all she had, Joshua was spared. And she lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Um, it was just a few years ago that Time Magazine ran as their front page uh, story an article entitled Score One for the Bible. And it was a story about the archaeological excavations that have taken place in ancient Jericho. I have a great love for biblical archaeology. I wish we could just call the sermon off and spend a couple hours and just talk about Jericho because it is a wonderful testimony to the accuracy of the Bible and the power of God. Let me, uh, let me deviate for just about a minute or two is give you a, a, a little taste of what has been found at this site um, over in Palestine. Um, in excavating this time period, this layer, when Joshua would have been moving through Jericho and conquering the land in about 1400 B.C., they have discovered large defensive walls, just like the Bible talks about. However, they've discovered an interesting thing. The walls around Jericho fell out. They didn't fall in. 
Now you would think that if you were going to use a battering ram and, and push against walls as an opposing army, the walls would fall in and wouldn't fall out. But quite inexplicably, the walls around Jericho fell out. Um, this information comes as quite a shock to those that don't believe the Bible. But those of us who believe that the Bible is God's word and that it's an accurate account of the things that took place back in Jericho, back in um, Joshua's time, we're not surprised by this at all. Although we are thankful that um, finally the, the evidence has come to light and the Bible has vindicated itself once again. This is just typical of biblical archaeology. The more we know, the more accurate the Bible proves itself. And, and it just it goes back to the kinds of things that we've said to you all along. If you'll give the Bible a chance, it provides plenty of reasons for you to invest your faith in the Bible as the Word of God. The passage that we've read for you today is a common passage. I want to take kind of an uncommon look at it because I'm interested in the fact that God didn't just ask the children of Israel to sit there and watch while everything took place. In fact, He had some very specific instructions. And what I want to do today is I want to suggest to you that God wants His children to do some specific things in the process even of seeing God at work. And the things that God wanted for the children of Israel are the things that God wants for us today. And I want to suggest to you three things that God wants from you and me, things that He wanted from Joshua and the children of Israel. The first thing is this. God wants us to work. God wants us to work. And this might come as a little bit of a surprise to you. I hope not. But just because we're on God's side doesn't mean that we're without significant things to accomplish. Some people suppose that being a Christian means that you're saved and you just bide your time until the Lord comes again or you die. That's not the case at all. God wants us to work. It's strange that we should mention this perhaps, some would, would say, in, uh, in light of the fact that we live under God's grace in the New Testament. And so my first point here is God's grace and our work. They really do fit together. Notice what verses 2 and 3 say in our text. God says, I've given you, I've given Jericho into your hand. You shall march. Wait, 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 wait. Why should we march if Jericho's been given to us? Well, just because God gives it to you doesn't mean there's nothing for you to do. The same thing is true on a New Testament level. Just because God saved us by His grace given us His salvation, that doesn't mean that we're without significant things to do in His kingdom. Grace is the soil in which good works have been planted. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 puts it this way. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And notice what this verse, this verse 10 says. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Yes, God saved us by His grace, but He has saved us in order to work. Not saved us by our works, but certainly saved us in order that we would engage in the activities He's designated for us. Verse 7, where God wanting us to work is concerned, God wants us all to work. Verse 7, He says to the people, go forward and march around the city. All the people were to shout at the appropriate moment. And you say to yourself, wow, this is a lot of people. There are 600,000 soldiers. There's another million, million and a half, maybe two million non-soldiers, civilian types. That's a lot of people. Why on earth does he want all of them to be involved? Because that's the way God's family is. There's something for everyone to do. You'll notice that all the people are asked to engage in some kind of activity, and that's just indicative of the way that it always is in the family of God. Did you know that in the average church, 15% of the people do 85% of the work. 
That's roughly the way that it, that it uh, boils down. Uh, approximately 15% of the people do 85% of the giving in the, in the average church. So what that means is that in the average church, 85% of the people do only 15% of the work in the giving. Um, we addressed this specifically a few weeks back as we talked about our congregation and involving everyone in ministry. We're not the average congregation, and for that I'm, I'm very thankful. But what this means is that there are great untapped resources within the family of God. And God wants all of us to engage in ministry. Now, if, if I said to you, um, is there a minister in your church? You might think to yourself, yeah, Ken, you're our minister. And you know, I really, there, there's part of me that likes the idea of being referred to as a minister. Do you know what a minister is? The word that's translated minister in the New Testament simply means servant. That, that's a good designation for any Christian to be a servant. But it troubles me that some people think that there's this special class of super Christians that we designate as ministers. And we ordain them and we pay them and we think they're the ones that carry on ministry. God intends for everyone in his family to be a minister. And in fact, we talk in this church about every member ministry. We want you to be a minister. We want you to engage in the tasks that the Lord has put before his church. Because God wants all of us to work. God not only wants all of us to work, God wants us to work together. It's possible for us all to work, but to be working in different directions at different things and not toward the same goals. It might be possible to have a situation where everyone in the church works, but the result is actually destructive because we're not pulling together, we're pulling against one another. A common metaphor or a common analogy that's used in the scripture is that of a body. Paul says that the church is just like the body of Jesus Christ. And we're each individual members of that body. We form different parts of the body. And uh, he says every part is important. The seen parts, the parts that are the upfront parts that we we think about, and the unseen parts. To illustrate, um, how many of you have seen your pancreas lately? No one has seen their pancreas lately. How many of you have a pancreas? Oh, that's good. It's a good thing to have a pancreas. It's a good thing to have a functioning pancreas. If you have no functioning pancreas, you die. How many of you gave thought to your pancreas prior to this moment? <coughs> In the last six months? Ah, see, we're not pancreas thinking people, are we? Does that make the pancreas any less important? And are you glad that you don't have to think about your pancreas for it to function? We'd probably all be in a bad way if we had to think about all of the things in our body that have to take place in order for them to take place. They just do their thing, don't they? Paul says that's the way it is in the body of Christ. We all work together. There are parts of the body that are seen, but there are some parts that we may never think about, but that doesn't make them any less important. God has equipped you to make a difference in the body of Christ. He's given you talents and abilities. He's given you experiences. He's given you all kinds of things in your life that makes you unique and different and specially equipped to be an important part of his body. And there's no such thing as an unimportant member of Christ's body. God wants us all to work together. God wants us to work together in our role. This is kind of a continuation of this. Notice from verse 20 how the different people were doing different things. The priests did one thing and the soldiers did another. And, and there were people blowing trumpets and people shouting and people marching. Not everyone did the same thing. 
look, it's okay that you can't sing. At least I hope it's okay, because I can't. It's okay that you can't play the drums. It's okay that you can't teach a Sunday school class. It's okay. All those things that you can't do, the Lord doesn't want you to focus in on your can'ts. He wants for you to identify your can'ts. And I guess we could say in this sense, ministry comes in can'ts, not in can'ts. Right? And God wants us to find those areas, and it might be just one area, where we excel at doing something that we love. And He wants us to use that for His glory. We have people in our church who, who, uh, who do specific things that most of you don't know anything about. They don't need great public praise. It isn't rocket science what they do, but what they do is an important part of the body of Christ and its function. And that's the way God intended for it to be, each of us working in our role. Finally, God wants us to work in faith. Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. We end this point where we begin. God expects our works to be an expression of our faith. By engaging in ministry, we're not saying you earn your salvation. By engaging in important tasks within the body of Christ, we're not suggesting that you earn grounding points with God. This really becomes the expression of our faith. How does faith express itself? It works. Faith doesn't just sit around and say, oh yeah, I believe. James says a faith like that is the kind of faith that the demons have. But a faith that is a saving faith, a truly valid faith, is a faith that makes a difference in our lives and in the Lord's church. He expects our works to be done with faith in God. And we are seeking to glorify Him. God wants us to work. Second thing God wants us to do is God wants us to wait. I hate this. I absolutely hate it. Any of you like waiting? No. I, I, you know, um, when I drive, I get particularly impatient. You know, if I pull up behind you and it's a left-hand turn, you do not have the sense enough to get out into the intersection to make your left hand turn and make me sit through the light. You can tell I get a little bit upset about that. It isn't in the Bible, but it should be. <laughs> right? Now you, can, you, can, you, can, you can appreciate that. Or, or at the grocery store, you know, there can be six lanes. And I evaluate the size of the checkouts, and I go to the what I suppose to be the quickest lane. And it, it always happens. The person in front of me has five items that don't scan properly, and, and I'm, I'm standing there, it seems like, for forever. We do not wait well. It's interesting. I find it very interesting. God could have just looked at Jericho and said, and it, and it would have been done. You know? He could have done that. Instead, he says, we're going to take seven days to accomplish this. You know, he could have done this microwave style. Instead, he chose the crock pot. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I tend to be a microwave kind of guy. Are you with me here? In text messaging, uh, email, uh, cell phone. I mean, we're, we're, that's the way we are. God sees the benefit of calling his people <coughs> sometimes just the way. Now, um, there are some difficulties attached to this. Um, you know, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus uh, was resurrected for 40 days. He taught his apostles. And then he left here and he said, you go back to Jerusalem and wait. Remember how long he waited? Ten days. That had to be an awfully long 10 days. So, well, why have him wait 10 days? 
God's timing. That's the way God wanted it. He knew that was, was what was best. And there had to be something intrinsically good about them waiting for God's time and not just doing it in their own impetuous way. And so God said, go back and wait. God does this at times in our lives, I believe. <coughs> you ever pray for something and God's answer was not really yes and it wasn't really no, it was just keep praying, keep thinking about it, keep talking to me. Sometimes, to be honest with you, sometimes that's the hardest kind of answer. You know, I, I can take a no because no means no, and I, I get on with it, you know. I, I go on with what I'm doing. But the wait means that I have to put it in neutral, and, and I have to think about what's going on. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't conform to my idea of why things should be quick and easy. Part of, I think, what God is working in us when He asks us to wait is that He is helping us understand that we are more than just about the here and now. God has created us for eternity. Nothing forces us to acknowledge that quite like waiting. When God makes me wait, it makes me acknowledge the fact that it's not just the here and now, it's not just my impetuous desire to have what I want immediately. I have been created in the image of God for all eternity. And He is working that sense of eternity out in me by calling upon me to wait. There are benefits to this. As I wait, God develops in me patience. You like the patient lessons? Oh, I hate the patient lessons. <laughs> my uh, brother Jim said I prayed for patience and, my, and, the, and the Lord gave me a daughter. <laughs> I, I prayed for patience to deal with my daughter and the Lord gave me a son. I stopped praying for patience. <laughs> <laughs> but God develops patience in us when we're called upon the way. God is developing a sense of trust in us as we wait. Because now it's not my timetable, it's God's timetable. Nothing forces me to place my faith in God quite like waiting on His timing. And that's a difficult thing to do. Waiting helps us to think and act rather than simply react. We tend to be reactive individuals who respond almost spontaneously to our circumstance. God would rather be that we be people who reflect and pray. And when God does act, we appreciate His activity because He's waited before He acted. We're out there marching around those, those walls for seven days. When the walls finally came, there was a sense of anticipation. There was a sense of expectation. And God works that out in us as He calls on us to wait. Final thing that God wants us to do, He wants us to work, He wants us to wait. God wants us to win. Do you like to win? Uh, I don't know if I like winning so much as I hate losing. Uh, you know, and, and Christianity is not for losers. Aren't you glad? Christianity is not for losers. God wanted for His children to win. The world tends to view Christianity as weak rather than strong. The world sees the family of God as missing out on those important, fun things in life. But really, we know that God is working out in us victory in a victory of eternal proportions. God wants us to win. He wants us to know that we are winners, not losers. And He wants us, I believe, to act and live like people who are winners. I don't believe in the Casper Milk Toast approach to Christianity. Humble, yes. Apologetic, no. God has called us to victory in Christ. Verse 2, we read that the victory was sure. This is before they've ever 
encountered and fought someone from Jericho. God says, I've given Jericho into your hands. <laughs> it's a done deal. I mean, God talks about it in the past tense. You like that? Oh, by the way, Jericho's yours. I like that. He says, with its kings and all its valiant words. It's a done deal. We see this kind of matter-of-fact promise given in the New Testament as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about facing death and overcoming death and resurrection. The victory is ours through Jesus Christ. We're winners. We're not losers. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14, he says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. The book of Revelation communicates this well. You know, people make the book of Revelation rocket science and numerology. And uh, I suppose there is, there is uh, some justification for that. A lot of people are intimidated, confused, or totally enamored by the book of Revelation. They, they end up missing the forest for the trees. You know what the message of the book of Revelation is? The message of the book of Revelation is an eternal message. When it's all said and done, God wins. And the sub-message to that is, if you're on God's side, you're a winner too. That, that really is the totality of the message of the book of Revelation. Victory is sure. Verse 21 tells us that victory was complete. Notice from verse 21, they utterly destroyed everything in the city. God doesn't do things halfway. It wasn't an almost victory. It wasn't a victory where they lost lots of people but still won the day in the end. It was total, complete, utter destruction for the city of Jericho. When a victory is declared for God's people, it's a victory indeed. Nobody has to wonder who wins. God always makes sure that victory is clear. And then verses 19 and 24 of our text. The victory is to God's glory. Did you catch what happened to everything in the city? Everyone and everything was killed. Everything was burned and destroyed. The only exception was all of the precious metals and things made of iron. You see what happened to them? They went into the Lord's treasure. Why? Because ultimately we do not labor for our own benefit. Ultimately when it's all said and done, God's the one that gets the glory. On the day of judgment, when we share in the victory with God, Who gets the glory? I guarantee you there's not going to be anyone in heaven pat themselves on the back about how smart they are. It's going to be all about God and what He did. We do not work for the approval or the applause of men. Rather, we work for the glory of God. God wants us to work together as His family, each in His own role. God wants us to wait on His timing, building confidence in what He is going to do in the sense of the eternal. And finally, God wants us to win so that His name will be glorified and people will be drawn to Him.